Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rom. In our top story, more than 100 hostages taken captive in Israel on October 7th by the Hamas terror group were released during the recent ceasefire. 81 Israelis and 29 foreigners were transferred from the Iranian-backed terror group in Gaza to Israel by the International Red Cross. The Israeli Ministry of Health has confirmed that the hostages were drugged by Hamas terrorists before their release so that they would seem calm and happy in front of the cameras. The pause in fighting was broken by barrages of rocket fire on Israeli communities throughout the country. Israel has resumed its defensive war in the terror enclave as it continues to strengthen its hold on northern Gaza while expanding the fighting into terror pockets in the south. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has announced that the Palestinian Authority cannot control Gaza after Israel wipes out Hamas. U.S. President Joe Biden and Secretary of State Anthony Blinken have repeatedly suggested that a reformed PA should rule the coastal enclave after the war. But Netanyahu insisted this is impossible. He said the Palestinian Authority holds the same ideology as Hamas. It believes in the destruction of the Jewish state. It finances and promotes terrorism. It pays murderers and educates their children to hate Israel and rejects the existence of the Jewish state. Netanyahu stressed that it is for these reasons the PA cannot be allowed to control Gaza. Israel's permanent delegation to the United Nations hosted a special session to condemn the world's silence on Hamas's war crimes against Israeli women. Gilad Erdan, Israel's ambassador to the UN, said that Hamas used rape and sexual violence as weapons of war. Sadly, the silence of international bodies who are supposedly defenders of women has been deafening. Erdan said the hypocrisy and double standards of UN women and other UN agencies completely abandoned Israeli women assaulted by Hamas. This comes as State Department spokesman Matthew Miller suggested that the Iranian-backed terror group is refusing to release the remaining female hostages in its custody because it does not want them to testify about their treatment in captivity. The Israel Defense Forces discovered more than 800 terror tunnels under the Gaza Strip. The intricate network of subterranean passages built by the Iranian-backed Hamas terror group is said to be more expansive than the New York City subway system. Fanatical Islamic terrorists are using these passages to hide their leaders as well as hostages and weapons. Tunnels have also been dug from Gaza into Israeli communities, posing a huge threat to the Jewish state. IDF soldiers uncovered tunnel openings in the civilian areas of Gaza, many of which were located inside schools, kindergartens, mosques, and playgrounds. They also found huge stockpiles of weapons and munitions in the underground passageways. So far, the IDF has destroyed 500 of the terror tunnels. The Army is reportedly considering flooding shafts with seawater to destroy the terrorist hideouts. Several commercial ships sailing in the Red Sea have come under attack by drones and missiles fired by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. The United States Central Command announced that in one day, there were four attacks against three commercial vessels operating in international waters in the southern Red Sea. It added that these attacks represent a direct threat to international commerce and maritime security. A United States destroyer in the region responded to distress calls from the ships and shot down the enemy drones. CENTCOM said we have every reason to believe that these attacks, while launched by the Houthis in Yemen, are fully enabled by Iran. The United States has provided thousands of munitions, including bunker buster bombs, to Israel since the outbreak of the war with Hamas. The Wall Street Journal reported that so far, America has sent 15,000 bombs, including 100 bunker busters and 57,000 artillery shells to the Jewish state. Israel remains under a constant barrage of rocket fire from Hamas in Gaza, as well as from Hezbollah in Lebanon. Both terror groups are backed, funded, and armed by the radical Shiite regime in Tehran, which has issued repeated calls to wipe the Jewish state off the map. The threat from Hezbollah and its stockpile of precision-guided weapons has prompted the evacuation of entire communities in northern Israel.
Many military analysts believe the Iranian-backed terror group is trying to exhaust Israel's defensive capabilities so that it will be at greater risk when Hezbollah unleashes its advanced weaponry on the Jewish state. Israeli philanthropist Dr. Miriam Adelson has purchased the Dallas Mavericks basketball team from Mark Cuban for an estimated $3.5 billion. The two Jewish billionaires will be reportedly forging a partnership that involves Cuban's continued control of the Mavericks' operations, while Adelson and her family are expected to hold a majority stake in the NBA basketball team. The Israel Allies Foundation joined with hundreds of European leaders and members of the EU Parliament in Brussels to discuss how to stop radicalization in the Palestinian Authority. The conference also addressed the European Union's role in combating the spread of anti-Semitism and extremism that has become commonplace throughout Europe. Keynote speaker Sharon Haskell, who co-chairs the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus, discussed the indoctrination to violence in the Palestinian educational system. She said the October 7th terrorists were bred on a deep hatred of the Jewish people from as early as their kindergarten days. She added that if the European Union continues to fund this kind of education and pay the salaries of those who disseminate it, there's no solution to ending terror. Ben-Gurion University has been awarded a $100 million grant to strengthen and rebuild southern Israel. The donation given by philanthropist Sylvan Adams will be allocated for an extensive plan aimed at advancing education and campus life at Ben-Gurion University, which is located in the heart of Israel's Negev Desert. The school is currently housing dozens of families who were displaced when Hamas terrorists infiltrated Israel, murdering 1,200 people and kidnapping 240 others back to Gaza. Adams said after the October 7th massacre of Israeli civilians by Hamas, it is crucial that we strengthen Israel's south to ensure that Israelis feel safe and secure to rebuild their lives in the Negev. Israel's National Security Agency has raised the threat level in 80 countries across the globe. Specific warnings were issued regarding dozens of nations, especially those bordering Iran. The NSA advised Israelis and Jews to refrain from traveling to those areas. The agency noted that there are increased efforts by Tehran and its proxies, such as Hamas, as well as elements of the global jihadi movement, to attack Israeli and Jewish targets around the world. Israelis were encouraged to stay away from protest and to refrain from wearing Jewish symbols abroad. Israeli leaders memorialized Henry Kissinger, who passed away last week at the age of 100 years old. Kissinger and his family fled Nazi Germany in 1938. He became the first Jewish Secretary of State and served under Presidents Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon. Kissinger advised numerous world leaders in their diplomatic strategy and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to end the Vietnam War. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that each meeting with Henry Kissinger was not just a lesson in diplomacy, but also a masterclass in statesmanship. His understanding of the complexity of, of international relations and his unique insights into the challenges facing our world were unparalleled. Israel's Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development has issued an urgent call for volunteers to help save Israel's farms. Since the devastating Hamas massacre on October 7th, there's been a lack of workers and the crops are in danger of spoiling. Many of Israel's agricultural workers have been called up to serve in the army or have been too frightened to return to their jobs. So the government has turned to the public to help save the crops. The ministry is funding logistical costs for volunteers to work in the fields amid the emergency situation. This includes transportation, accommodation, and meals for volunteers to fill the gap until permanent workers can be hired. Jews around the world are celebrating the festival of Hanukkah, which commemorates the Maccabean revolt and the rededication of the Holy Temple in the second century BCE. After outlawing the practice of Judaism and attempting to force the Jews to worship his idols, the Hellenistic ruler Antiochus Epiphanes sent his army into Jerusalem. They slaughtered thousands of Jews and desecrated the Holy Temple. But a group of brave warriors led by Judah Maccabi chose to fight rather than becoming slaves to paganism. The small but courageous Jewish army defeated the mighty Greeks, cleansed the temple, 
and reinstated the practice of Judaism in the land of Israel. During this eight-day holiday, Jews light candles to commemorate the purification of the temple and to remember the miracle that God performed in those days in order to restore his people to his covenant in his holy city and to remember that God's light will shine from Jerusalem forever. We did Israel Now News would like to wish all of our viewers a Chag Hanukkah Sameach. Happy Hanukkah! That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned now for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is David Parsons. He's the vice president and spokesperson of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. David, thanks for being on the show. Good to see you again, Josh. Tell our viewers a little bit about what is the International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem. The Christian Embassy has been here since 1980, representing Christians around the world who have a, a heart, a love, a concern for Israel and the Jewish people, and a, a biblical understanding of the role that Israel, and particularly Jerusalem, plays, a Jewish Jerusalem, uh, not only in biblical history, but in redemptive history as well, prophetic uh, history, and so we're here to uh, to represent Christians to Israel and also to go and explain Israel's story and make the case for Israel out uh, in the world. Yeah, you're the premier organization for Christians here on the ground in Israel, and you've really stepped up your efforts during uh, the current war since October 7th. What have you been involved in? Well, we've uh, been through many crises in, in Israel over the decades, uh, but nothing like this. Uh, the, what happened on October 7th really hit the nerve of the Holocaust, which so many Christians, there's been a sea change in Christian views on Israel since the depths of the, the depravity of the Holocaust were revealed, many changing their hearts. But this is the most challenging moment for Israel. We realize that. And we've been helping with more bomb shelters, ambulances, uh, f feeding uh, uh, displaced families, helping house them, picking fruit from some of the orchards and, and some of the crops that are going to, to rot unless someone goes and helps the farmers in, along the Gaza border pick them. Hey, the God's Envelope has always been a focus for the Christian embassy. Even before the current war, uh, you guys even have a forest there, the mm. International Christian Embassy Forest. You, you plant flowers. Why is that important to you? Well, we've been investing in that area for around 15 years in particular. We put over 150 portable bomb shelters there. We were the first ones going in uh, with one of our partners to put in bomb shelters at, at, say, bus stops, at daycare, at medical clinics, places that need to stay open during, uh, you know, when the rockets are, are flying. Since then, we've helped with firefighting equipment, uh, many other things. And we were actually there paying a solidarity visit uh, just two days before during Sukkot, during the Feast of Tabernacles. We had over 700 Christians there. We introduced, I introduced introduced the mayor of uh, the regional council, Sha'ar Hanegev Regional Council, Mr. Ophir Lipstein. Uh, he gave a warm greeting, said, please come back next year. And two days later, he was the first named casualty of this conflict. So it, it was shocking for all of Israel. It was surreal for us, and it's made it very personal, and we're committed to helping these communities uh, rebuild as soon as they're able. You guys are just all over the place doing a lot of different things. It seems like there's a lot of pressure on you because you're actually here on the ground. Mm -hmm. Are Christians answering the call? Are Christians stepping up and, yeah. and supporting this? Well, we've had uh, three different uh, prongs of our response to this. Uh, of course, the relief aid and Christians are stepping up uh, in an amazing way. Uh, we've had solidarity rallies in in uh, countries all over the world. Uh, we, you know, the, you see the Maori in New Zealand, uh, the tribes there. We had a big uh, meeting in Fiji and the Pacific Islands, all the way to Lapland in the north of 
of Finland. Uh, so solidarity, standing with Israel, even uh, taking some slings from the other side for daring to just stand there and pray for the hostages. And then our third prong is prayer. And we've had uh, over 20,000 Christians through our daily prayer gathering over the past two months. It's quite amazing. We, we get over a thousand every day joining us in a two-hour prayer session online, our daily global prayer gathering. And all three of these elements are very important in us standing with Israel today. We've both been very much involved in faith-based uh, diplomacy since its inception 20 years ago. And I think this is the first time uh, during this war that people are like, you know what, we're not alone. You know, mm -hmm. there are millions of Christians who are standing with us, who are bringing political support, financial support, prayer rallies all over the world. Mm -hmm. How important do you think this is for the Jewish people to see that Christians are stepping up? When the Christian embassy was born in 1980, the nations were outraged that, that the Knesset had declared the United City of Jerusalem the capital of, of Israel forever, uh, and the uh, Arab powers threatened a, a, an oil embargo against any nation still had its embassy here. They all left. There was not one nation willing to stand with this 3,000-year-old Jewish claim and connection to this city, but that's when Christians stood up and it was a time when Israel felt isolated, and sometimes you have to thank God for the threats of oil embargoes or whatever. You find the good side of it, that, that it was a moment for Jews and Christians to come together in solidarity, and the Jewish people felt it more because of that Mormon isolation. And we're in another one of those, Josh, now. And it is uh, being felt. I know the big rally in Washington a couple weeks ago, there were tens of thousands of Christians in that massive crowd on the mall in Washington standing with Israel. Dave, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? We need your help to stand with Israel at this moment. It is a unique time. Uh, I've lived here uh, almost 30 years now, been visiting for over 40 years, and Israel has never been so challenged. Uh, right now, the war down in, in Gaza seems to be a, a bit localized there, but you still feel it all over the nation. And the threat of Hezbollah in the north, of terrorism coming out of Judea, Samaria, the West Bank. We need you to stand with us and continue giving this message that Christian love, care, and concern for Israel is here to stay, and now is the moment to express it, and we really appreciate your help. Thank you, Dave, for being on the show, and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, wishing you a happy Hanukkah. Now back to the studio. And now, the truth from Zion. Hamas is a vicious terrorist organization that has been sanctioned and boycotted by many countries around the world. But who are they? What is their connection to Iran? And why do they persist in violently antagonizing Israel and suppressing their own people? Hamas was founded in 1987 as a Palestinian terrorist group created to destroy the state of Israel. The name of the organization is an acronym in Arabic which translates to the Islamic Resistance Movement in English. Hamas opposes the existence of Israel, wishing to drive out all traces of Jewish life in the area. Hamas emerged as a powerhouse during the first Intifada, a period of Palestinian uprising between 1987 and 1993. The Intifada began with Palestinians throwing rocks and Molotov cocktails at Israelis, but the violence eventually led to the use of rifles, hand grenades, explosives, and even suicide bombings. That tactic was taken from the neighboring terror group Hezbollah, which operates out of Lebanon. The Israeli military and police responded to Hamas-led violence against Israelis in the late 80s and early 90s with an iron fist. In 2005, the Gaza disengagement began. It was an initiative the Israeli government took to move every last Jew out of the communities in the Gaza Strip. The political echelon ordered the Israeli army to enter the Gaza Strip and forcefully remove some 8,000 Jewish residents who had lives, farms and businesses on the land. The Israeli government hoped this major capitulation would bring about peace in the Middle East. 
Nearly 20 years later, the pullout from Gaza did not lead to peace, but to war. Within two years of the disengagement, Hamas evolved into a powerful political and military force and gained complete control over the entire Gaza Strip by 2007. The takeover was violent as Hamas clashed with Fatah, the other rival terror group in the Gaza Strip at the time. Gaza's economy has become isolated, creating hardship for honest merchants trying to conduct business. Hamas leaders behave like mafia bosses. They collect random taxes from business owners, make arbitrary choices about who is allowed to set up shop, and offer friends of the regime kickbacks. Anyone who disagrees with their ways is subject to torture and execution. This has caused the enclave to face poverty. Many Gazans live without basic necessities, not to mention luxuries. But there is one thing that the Strip seems to have in abundance, rockets to launch at Israel. In 2014, Ahmed Hosseini, the missile commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, admitted Hamas operatives had been armed and trained by Hezbollah in Lebanon, and that some of them even came to Iran for instruction. During a flare-up in 2021, terrorists shot 4,300 rockets at Israel. Many misfired, killing Palestinian civilians who lived near the launch site. In 2022, 1,100 were fired. And in October of 2023, Hamas launched a brutal attack on Israel, firing thousands of rockets and mortars into Israeli cities and towns, and sending hundreds of militants into Israel to commit murder, kidnapping, and other atrocities. This was the worst attack on Jewish people since the Holocaust. Experts claim the sheer magnitude and coordination of this attack bears the fingerprints of Iran. Iran is directly involved in everything that Hamas does. They fund Hamas, they help train Hamas, they send them weapons. We've seen the massacre that Hamas has done on October 7th. Iran has to be held directly responsible because they've helped Hamas get to this point. There's also reports that Iran asked Hamas to do this massacre. We don't know exactly at this point how true these reports are, but even if they're true, they won't be surprising because they're incredibly involved in everything that Hamas does, and Iran has to be held responsible also for the terrorist attacks that are done by Hamas. Iran encourages Hamas to launch rocket attacks to intentionally escalate tensions in the region. Iran may be 1,435 miles east of the Holy Land, but Hamas is in Israel's backyard. The U.S. State Department considers Iran the world's biggest state sponsor of terrorism. As countries like the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and even talks of Saudi Arabia signing peace deals with Israel, it's clear that the veil is slowly being lifted, and the world is beginning to see which country is the true threat to stability in the Middle East. Up next, the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Dear friends, I'm coming to you from the Gaza envelope, from Kibbutz Be'eri, the place that probably was worst hit by those atrocities of October 7. 10% of the population of this kibbutz was, were killed, mutilated, raped, and it was a day where the president of Israel said it was the darkest day in the history of the Jewish people since the Holocaust. What we saw on October 7 was not just a military conflict that was unfolding, but it was a vicious demonic attack that targeted mainly civilians that li were living here in this community. Kibbutz Be'eri was one of the most peaceful places in Israel. During most of the year, young families enjoyed living here and raising their children in that community. On October 7, everything was changed. Now, the Word of God tells us that the battle in which we are engaging, it is not a battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers in the heavenly places. And what we have seen in Kibbutz Beri was a demonic manifestation of the spirit of Amalek. It was p hitting people that were peace-loving residents of this community, like the following story. 
כן, הבית הזה גרה פה ויביאן, שהייתה פעילת שלום, שבאה מקנדה, אין יותר ממנה, הייתה מסיעה, אנשים עד לעזה, היו אוכלים אצלה, שותים, ופה היא מצאה את מותה. פשוט מאוד לא שרפו לה את הבית ורצחו אותה. ומה שאני אומר, חמאס, דאעש, נאצים, הם לא בוכלים, אין חברים. הם רוצים להרוג את כל היהודים ואת כל הנוצרים בעולם. זה האמונה שלהם וזה מה שהם רוצים. What you hear here, it's a rebirth of the spirit of Amalek in our time. I don't think this spirit of Amalek, of hating the Jews, wanting to annihilate the Jewish people, will be more powerful manifested than on October 7th. I want to call upon our prayer partners from around the world to understand, even though you see the physical destruction of that house, we are not, a, we are not waging a, a physical war. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, blood, but against demonic powers that are operating over there in Gaza with organizations like Hamas, like Islamic Jihad, that have one target to annihilate the Jewish people. This spirit needs to be addressed in prayer. We need you to speak out to your communities about the atrocities that were taking place here in this land. And it's a time where the church needs to wake up, where they need to stand up. Not only confessions are enough today, where we say we love Israel, but actions are needed. Vivian's story showed us that this is indeed a demonic force that was unleashed that is operating still inside Gaza today. Israel needs to deal with that, of course, in a military means, but we need Christians around the world who are facing that challenge of Amalek, of anti-Semitism, of Jew hatred that is operating there, not only here in this region of the Middle East, but it is seen also today on the streets of Europe and the streets even of America and even on some of the most liberal campuses in the world. Today we need to pray for Israel like never before. I'm reminded in these days on the story of Exodus chapter 17, on the story of Amalek as they viciously attacked the Jewish people. It was a spiritual battle that on the one side it was fought on the ground with Joshua and his army. At the same time, Moses and Aaron and Hur were on the mountain praying and interceding for the people of Israel. I want to tell you that this is the day when the church needs to stand with Israel, like Moses, like Aaron, like her, on the mountain to pray for a clear victory of Israel against those forces of darkness. Today, a praying church is being needed around the world. Please join our various prayer initiatives, either the Global Prayer Gathering, the Rosh Chodesh Prayer 24-7 campaign. Israel needs today your prayer more than ever. Thank you so much for standing with us, and I look forward to see you and to welcome you in one of our prayer meetings. God bless you, here from the envelope of Gaza. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan Elrom reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.